reading is to your mind, what exercise is to your body, and you read to succeed. But I think it's one of the biggest skills you can learn to be able to up-level your learning and your life. If for every hour you listen to a podcast or read a book, spend an equal hour putting it into action. Because the truth is, all the podcasts and courses and books and lectures, none of it works unless we work. Our guest today is a New York Times bestselling author and world-renowned expert on accelerated learning. His clients include industry giants like Google, Virgin, Nike, SpaceX, 20th Century Fox, and the list goes on and on. So buckle in and get tuned in because your brain is about to get an upgrade with the incredible Jim Quick. All right, this is an iconic moment here. We've got our most frequent guest back on the show and somebody who's had such a remarkable impact on my life I can't even put into words. Even this show being in existence is largely tied to you. And this was about, we haven't been knowing each other, I don't know if you realize this, almost 15 years. I did know that, yeah. All right. And you saw something in me that I didn't necessarily even see in myself and start to put me in positions to help to educate people at a bigger level. But you and I were doing a talk in Las Vegas and you yeah. introduced me to a couple and they asked me to be kind of the face of their podcast. Yeah. And at the time, I didn't know what podcasts were. Nobody did. <laughs> Nobody did. But they said they had just started this podcast and they were looking for somebody to be like the face of this, you know, the resident nutritionist basically. And I ended up taking that role on and that eventually evolved into starting my own show, The Model Health Show, yeah. which is now over 10 years in existence. And Congratulations. so my guy. And how many quick, millions of people benefited from this show yeah. already? And you're just getting started. The thing about you, man, is that you don't necessarily try to bring magic into people's lives, but you do it just because of who you are. And you weren't thinking about some transformational thing taking place when you made that introduction of us, but it, it has, it impacted millions and millions of people at this point. And so I just wanna thank you, man. You know, every time I get to sit down with you is truly an honor. And being that this is the case and this is an iconic moment, yeah, and having yeah, yeah. you here, the guy, I've been telling my youngest son who I brought to the studio today to be able to sit and experience this, you've helped so many people to learn how to learn. And your first appearance on the show was almost 10 years ago. And since then, we've had about 75 million listener downloads since that point. And so there are people who don't know yeah. what you know. And so I want to go back to our origins and to share some of these skills. In particular, with now there's so much knowledge out here for us to be able to consume. Let's talk about being able to read faster yeah. and to retain information. Let's do it. Let's go. Yeah. What do yeah, you got yeah. for us? Nah. <laughs> well, it's, it's an honor to be back. You've also been, uh, you're the most frequent guest on our show, our podcast also as well. So it's very fitting. And uh, yeah, our team listens to your show all the time. Uh, so our CEO, Alexis, is always posting links in our in our Slack channel. So yeah, we're, we're big fans. We're Wonder Twins, man. Yeah. <laughs> What <laughs> wonder powers activate? Um, yeah, I think one of the most uh, as as a brain coach uh, for over thirty years, my passion is teaching people how to upgrade the most important wealth building device that they have, which is their their brains. I believe if knowledge is power, then learning is your superpower, and uh, it's not really taught in school. They teach you what to learn, classes like math and history and science, Spanish, but there are zero classes on how to learn those things. No classes on focus or concentration, uh, recall. You know, they teach you four, three R's in school, right? Reading, writing, arithmetic. But what about retention? Mm -hmm. You know, Socrates said learning is remembering. Without remembering, you don't, you don't have any knowledge, you know? And so when uh, we've, been, we've shared stages before, I'll do these demonstrations if there are times where I'll have the first few rows stand up and introduce themselves on the microphone and I'll memorize 50 or 60, 70 people's names. Uh, they'll challenge me to remember a hundred random words or hundred digit numbers and I'll do that forwards and backwards But I always tell people I don't do this to impress you I do this to express to you what's possible because the truth is every single person listening right now They could do it too and most some people are saying there's just no way yeah. But regardless of your age and your background your career your education level financial situation gender history IQ um, you could do it and We just weren't taught, you know, and I know it's possible because I couldn't do it once I, um, 
when I was five years old, I had a traumatic brain injury in kindergarten class, hurt my head really bad, rushed to the emergency room, blood everywhere. And I just, my parents said, you know, before I was very curious, very energized, very playful. But after that, I became very shut down. I couldn't focus. I couldn't remember. I had processing issues. Teachers would repeat themselves over and over again. And then I would learn to pretend to understand, but I didn't really understand. Mm. You know, it took me three years longer to learn how to read, and that was very frustrating. Every single time you got in those book circles and you had to read out loud, I think that's where a lot of fear of public speaking comes from because, you know, as that book inches closer and closer to you, you know, we're not good at it when we first get started, and we associate that nervousness and that insecurity with with speaking out loud or, or reading. And, um, and that was me. When I was nine years old, I remember I was slowing down a class, and... I was being teased really harshly for it. And a teacher came to my defense one day, pointed to me from the whole class and said, leave that kid alone. That's the boy with the broken brain. And that, that label became my, my limit. You know, this, this story ends up being okay. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was 18, I, I learned skills and strategies on how to overcome it. And I became, I mean, since then I've been passionate. I'm 50 years old and now I'm just, more determined than ever to help people to access the most incredible gift that they're given, you know, between their ears, you know, this three pound gray matter that doesn't come with an owner's manual and it's not user friendly. So I think one of the most important skills for all of us to embrace is our ability to learn how to learn, right? Because if you can learn how to focus and read and understand and retain and implement, you could apply that towards anything, medicine, martial arts, music, um, you know, mathematics, money, anything gets easier. So that, that's really, that's, that's, that's my superpower is learning how to learn and teaching other people how to learn. Absolutely. Yeah. And you've done it over and over again, as you mentioned, you know, being 50 years young now young, and yeah, like many decades of you teaching this, uh, this information is such a, it's such a diverse realm as well, because as you know, we're going to talk about this today too. We have a unique brain. Yeah. And we all kind of learn and process things differently. So we're going to get to that yeah. on the back end. But just in general, your one of your initial forays into this space was learning how to read faster. Yeah. And again, being that today we're just surrounded by so much information. And obviously somebody like myself working as a research scientist for many years, being able to read all of these studies that can be very, very thick. All right. Sometimes thickness isn't, you know, isn't the best. Some thickness is good. Some some can be very time consuming. And so let's dive in and start to articulate that a little bit. Yeah. And um, but in particular, being that this there's a lot of people that, you know, can come into the fold and offer advice about reading speed. But we want to learn how to read faster, but also remember what yeah. we're reading. That's what makes you different. Yeah, traditional speed reading is more associated with skimming and scanning, uh, skipping words, getting the gist of what you read. A lot of our students, their attorneys, their financial advisors, their their medical doctors. I don't think anyone wants their doctor to get the gist of what she's reading, mm -hmm. right? Um, so we really focus. It's not just speed reading; it's about smart reading, and everybody has this skill. So uh, typically, so I, I first of all the power of reading, right? In one of the reasons why we love your show so much is the amount of research you do and preparation that you do. You know, you, people could trust you because you're very well informed. And, you know, if, some, if an author like yourself has decades of experience and you put it into a book and somebody could sit down in a few days and read that book, they could download decades of insights and wisdom and experience, lessons in a few days. That, that, that's, that's an incredible advantage, Powerful. right? Just think about everybody who's listening, what would you study? You know, and most people read maybe two books a year, but if you could just even bump it up to one book a week, which is very doable, 50 plus books, 52 books a year, you could have a, like a master's or a PhD in, in any subject, yeah. right? From, from some of the best experts. So um, a few things that people could do, all right? First of all, you know, it's great that everybody has a to-do list. I, I also recommend people have a to-learn list, right? A, a to-read list. Um, reading is to your mind what exercise is to your body. It's one of the best ways to keep your, your brain mentally fit. Um, but we don't also prioritize our reading. You know, like even if you weren't speed reading, we could get through a book a week. The average book has about 64,000 words. 
and the average person reads about 200 words a minute. So if you divide those two numbers together, it takes about 320 minutes to get through one book. And it sounds like pretty daunting, but if you break that down into seven days in a week, that's about 45 minutes of reading a day. You know, so it's not totally undoable, yeah. right? Maybe doing 20 minutes and 20 minutes, breaking up a little bit. Um, most people also, they don't schedule their reading. You know, maybe they'll schedule their doctor's appointments or their, you know, parent-teacher conferences or, you know, maybe even their workout. But most, most of us, I think one of the most important productivity performance tools we have is our calendar. But if we don't schedule it, we wonder why at the end of the day we forgot or we neglected certain things. And so if people have seen pictures with me, with Elon or Oprah or any of these individuals, people always want to know how we bonded or connected. And we bonded over books. Mm. right you read to succeed you know you've heard the phrase leaders are readers so just committing and scheduling it that alone can, can make a big difference but yeah. if you want to up level it a few things that people things that people can do very practically uh, first of all there's certain obstacles to effective reading right sometimes it, it's important to know what the obstacles are so you could kind of you know kind of circumvent those things so the first one is lack of education right we're not born with the ability to read right we didn't come out of the the womb and just went out to the waiting area of the hospital and started reading magazines, right? It's a skill. And like all skills, they can be improved with training. But when's the last time we took a class called reading? We were like, how old? Six, seven years old? So the difficulty and demand has increased a lot, but how we read it is still the same as our last level of, of training. Mm -hmm. So that gap creates a lot of stress, information, anxiety. Symptoms include, you know, higher blood pressure, compression of leisure time, more sleeplessness, right? So it helps to be able to learn these skills, which we're going to talk about now. A big challenge, though, second one, I would say, is lack of focus. Have you ever, like, you know, read a page in a book, got to the end, and just forgot what you just read? And then some people are thinking, yes, and then they go back and reread it, and they still don't know what they just read. And the focus is, is a big challenge. Like, how do you focus on your meetings and, you know, focus with your family? And... Um, and one of the things that help you focus better is speed. Like, it's interesting. Your brain is the most incredible supercomputer. But when we read, we feed the supercomputer one word at a time. And we're metaphor. Even if I, we, you and I spoke like that, mm -hmm. everybody, what would their minds do? They would start drift thinking, of, yeah, they would drift off. They would think about other things. They would, uh, they would fall asleep. And that's what reading is. Because often when you read, you think about other stuff, your mind drifts off, you start falling asleep. A lot of people use reading as a sedative because they're reading too slow, right? It's the equivalent of riding a bike too slow. You start wobbling, right? You have no momentum. Or if you're driving, right? Let's say you're driving and in, in your neighborhood and you're, you're going, whatever, 20, 25 miles an hour. Are you really focused on the act of driving? No. What are you doing? You're drinking your, your coffee. You, you might be texting, which you know you shouldn't be doing, checking your makeup, thinking about the dry cleaning. But compare that to a race car driver, a trained race car driver who's taking hairpin turns at 200 miles an hour. Does that person have more or less focus? Much more focus. Mm -hmm. They're not thinking about the dry cleaning. They're not trying to text or anything else. They're 100% concentrated on what's in front of them. And that's what reading is. When you're reading faster, your mind's not going so slow because if you don't give your brain the stimulus it needs, it'll seek entertainment elsewhere in the form of distraction. And that's why we, we, we think about other things. Our mind wanders, right? Mm. And so I would say that I'm saying this up front because the mindset around reading is so important to address before the methods. Because some people think, oh, if he teaches me how to read faster, I'm not going to understand more. But actually, we have students in our online academy in 195 countries, every country in the world, and so we have a lot of data. And so we always test people. And when actually the faster readers tend to have actually better comprehension because they have better focus, right? Third obstacle, and then we'll go to solutions, are subvocalization is a big one. You know, subvocalization. Have you ever noticed when you read something, you hear that inner voice inside your head reading along with you? Hopefully it's your own voice. It's not like somebody else's voice. Um, and you have a great voice, right? You have, you have, you have that billion dollar voice, or, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's just a pleasure to listen to. I wish I had that. But it's one of those things where if you hear that voice and you have to say the words inside your head, that means your reading speed is limited to your speaking speed, but not your thinking speed, right? And another way is if you have to say all the words, your reading speed is limited to your talking speed, but not how fast you can think. That's why a lot of people could listen to your show or your audiobooks or anything else 
at 1.5 or 2x because you could understand that fast, but nobody could speak that fast. Now, the question that everyone's thinking now is, do you have to say the words in order to understand them? And the truth is we don't. Like when you're driving and see a stop sign, I guarantee you nobody listening mm-hmm. says the word stop. Right, but you understand hopefully what that word means. Ninety-five percent of the words we come across are like that stop sign. They call them sight words, words you've seen thousands of times, where you don't have to pronounce it. You under you see them known by sight, and so we don't have to say all, especially the filler words, the, of, and, there, because, right? You don't have to say New York City or computer in order to understand what those things are, and so we train people how to reduce the subvocalization. Um, and then finally, you know, regression is a big obstacle. Back skipping, we do it unconsciously. If you ever found yourself rereading lines or rereading words, a lot of times we do it because our eyes are just not trained, and uh, I'd say because of our focus. And so, what I would one suggestion is when you read, if you want greater speed and focus and understanding, use a visual pacer. You, know, you see, if you're watching this on, on video, I'm, I'm using my finger. But if you just underline with a pen, a highlighter, your finger, a mouse on a computer, that creates a, a focal point. So it, it's kind of like how we are as hunter-gatherers, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if, you're, if you're in a bush and you're hunting lunch, right, it, like a rabbit or carrot, depending on whatever your diet is, if a bush next to you moves, you have to look at what moves because it's your survival. It could be lunch mm-hmm. or you could be lunch, right? So when your finger goes across the page, your attention is being pulled through the information as opposed to your attention being pulled apart, right? People who underline, and you don't have to touch the, the page or the screen if you're reading on the screen, but you will read 25 to 50% more effectively using a visual pacer. That's not a little bit, that's a lot. Yeah. That's like say, reading, you know, saving 20 minutes of every hour, and that really adds up. You know, like they say, the average person at work has to read probably four hours a day, right? Just as email, you think about all the content you have to consume. But if you could just double your reading speed and save two hours a day over the course of a year, even one hour a day over the course of a year is 365 hours, right? How many 40 hour work weeks is that? Nine? Over nine, over two months of productivity you get back just saving just that hour a day. So using a visual pacer is really important. And what I would say, if you want to up-level this, and don't trust what I'm saying, test it. You know, set your timer on your phone, 60 seconds, read without your finger, and then pick up where you left off, do another 60 seconds, count the number of lines you just read. And everyone, by the way, when they're counting, will use a visual pacer. They'll point (laughs) to help Mm -hmm. them because they know that it'll help them to focus. And the reasons why is, number one, kids will naturally do it. Without training, they'll naturally use their finger to help them focus until we tell them not to. Mm. Adults do it. They may not use their finger, but when I ask them to count, they'll all use their finger to help them focus. Third reason, your eyes are attracted to motion, right? If something, someone ran across the screen right now, nobody, everyone would focus on that because your eyes are attracted Mm -hmm. to motion. But the fourth reason is interesting. It's how our neurology is set up. Certain senses work very closely together, like, um, have you ever been sick or know someone's sick and food just tastes different, right? When you can't breathe. And it, it's like, um, have you ever tasted a great tasting piece of fruit? Like right from, not something that's been sprayed and waxed in, this, you know, in the grocery store for six months, but right off the vine or something from the farmer's market. Have you ever tasted a great tasting peach before? Yeah. So in actuality, we're not tasting the peach. Our tongue's not capable of tasting um, what uh, peach is but you're actually smelling it, Mm -hmm. right? But your sense of smell and taste are so closely linked, your mind can't tell the difference. So is your sense of sight and your sense of touch, right? If you go to a toddler and you have keys and you say, look at my keys, look, what are they gonna do? They're gonna reach out and grab in order for them to understand it, right? But the sense of sight and touch are so closely linked. Just like uh, if if somebody lost their sense of sight, how would they read? their sense of touch, right? We were they just would, talking about Daredevil before the show. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They'll use they'll use Braille, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, or in Daredevil's case, he's super sensitive and could, could, could feel the ink, you know, on a, on a page. But that's the power. Literally, when people use their visual pacer, they'll say, I feel more in touch with my reading. And the words are very, you know, very, uh, very telling. And so even with your peripheral vision, the other thing is, 
the reason why a lot of times people get tired when they read and you know visual fatigue will lead to mental fatigue a lot of times when people are very t read they use it as a sedative mm -hmm. a lot of people have a book on their nightstand by their bed mm -hmm. they use it to fall asleep and that's not a great association to have towards reading because all learning is state dependent and you don't want to get bored or tired because you'll take that into the, your everyday reading um, but yeah literally one of the things is these fixations so they're about 10 words per line and if you're so a fixation is an eye stop so most people read one word at a time so that means they're making 10 eye stops and it's equivalent to being out here in LA on the the 405 or something and just in traffic you're just stopping 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 and it's very exhausting you know vi visually for your eyes and but if you look at one word your peripheral vision could definitely see the word to your left and to your right and so if you could see three or four words at an eye stop then you'd only have to stop maybe two or three times and that's much more efficient than stopping 10 times so part of it is like you know when you're going across the page is you don't have to go all the way to the margins you could go up to like the second to last word or the starting from the second word so you could pick up more efficiency there also as well but all that actually will get people to, to almost double their reading speed you know and which is incredible you save so much time you have so much more enjoyment you get so much more comprehension and and it's a real gift we could give ourselves you know i think again reading is to your mind what exercise is to your body and you read to succeed but i think it's one of the biggest skills you can learn to be able to up level your learning and your life yeah without wow. a doubt this is so powerful and you can get and it makes it fun like you read the things that you love until you love reading again mm, you know yeah, what i mean absolutely yeah. you know and so I mean, you know, for example, like we're getting your book for our, your new book for our entire team. And, you know, we do like our, you know, our big part of our culture obviously is reading and learning, but it's, it, those are the things that make a big difference. And then also taking what you learn and putting into action. I just want to remind everybody that a big lie, a limited idea entertained, that's the acronym for lie, limited idea entertained is that knowledge is power. You know, we've heard it so much, but I think it's the biggest lie in the personal performance industry. We know it's only potential power, only because power when we utilize it. Right. And I would remind everybody that just hearing a new idea and insight or reading a book, but not implementing it, you're no better off than somebody, you know, who's illiterate. So I would say for every hour you listen to a podcast or read a book, spend an equal hour putting it into action. Because the truth is, all the podcasts and courses and books and lectures, none of it works unless we work. Right. Like when I'm reading, the other thing for greater comprehension is ask more questions. You know, how can I use this? Why must I use this? When will I use this? How does this relate to what I already know? And when you ask these questions, you, you activate part of your brain called the reticular activating system. You've talked about it on the podcast, RAS. So your brain primarily is a deletion device. It's trying to keep information data out. Because if it let everything in, we would be overwhelmed, right? We'd be overloaded. So what you decide to let in is filtered through this reticular activating system. And what one of the ways of activating is to ask questions. Because, you know, years ago, my sister would send me postcards and emails with a very specific species, like type of dog. It was like a pug dog. And my question was like, why did she keep on sending me these photos of this dog? And then all of a sudden, I start seeing these pug dogs everywhere in my neighborhood. I would be, you know, at the at the grocery store checking out, and the person in front of me is holding a pug dog, right? I'd be running in my neighborhood, and someone, you know, was walking six pug dogs. But my question for everybody is, did these pug dogs magically appear in my neighborhood? No, they were always there, but I was deleting them. It never until I started asking the question that I started seeing them. Well, here, when you read a page in a book, if you have questions, you're like going through it. And instead of getting at the end and not retaining anything, all of a sudden you're like reading and you're like, oh, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog, there's a pug dog. So that's your comprehension. So you ask more questions, you're gonna get more answers. You ask better questions, you'll get better answers. You know, we, we've talked about in, you know, in a previous episode, this idea of a dominant question, like, we have 60,000 thoughts a day, and a lot of those thoughts come in the form of questions. And we have one question we ask more than any other question. And, you know, if you're asking, like, how do I get people to like me? All of a sudden, it, you know, your life reflects that, right? You start being a sycophant or start people pleasing. You become a martyr. People take advantage of you. Your personality changes depending on who you're spending time with. 
um, as opposed to asking questions like, what's the best use of this moment? You know, what do I, what can I be grateful for? How can I make this better? Then all of a sudden you're, you, you shine a spotlight on the answers in, in your life. So if you want greater speed, use your finger while you read. If you want better comprehension, ask better questions. Oh, wow. And we can do this for ourselves. This is what's so yeah. powerful about this is that these are things we can proactively do and put in place once we realize it. And that visual pacer, again, could be your finger, a pen, yeah, highlighter, highlighter. Uh, I don't know. If you're, yeah, if you're on a computer, you could use your mouse or, or something like a that. A meat stick. Yeah. Whatever. And anything. <laughs> I, I like fingers because most of us, you know, bring them with us. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you just said something really, well, you said a lot that was powerful, but one of the most remarkable, and I had this happen firsthand, especially going to, you know, a traditional university and just all the books you got to, yeah. and then what a scam, by the way, with the books, they're like $300 for a yeah. Come on, man. Stop and when it. you sell them back, you get like 20 bucks. Yeah, come on, man. So, but, you know, going through that, and I remember my wife, she said when, when she graduated, she had honors, cum laude, all wow. the things, right? She was like, I'm done. She was basically, she was essentially said, I'm never going to read again. I'm done. Yeah. And it was finding a love or finding a connection to reading that got me here. Because for both of us, I felt much the same way. And... It was being able to dive into a, 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 a fiction book that got me back into nonfiction, yeah. which was The Da Vinci Code. You know, that came out around that time. We had both, you know, just finished school and Angels and Demons and yeah. uh, Dan Brown. And so reading those books created a new kind of love affair. But she was reading one of them like ahead of me. And I was because I was working at the university at the time. And she'll be waiting on me to so we can discuss it. You know, like, so she'll be waiting in the other room and I'm just going there and I'm just like trying to read and absorb this as fast as I can. And I didn't have these skills, you know. And so sometimes she'd be waiting and she'd be like getting irritated, like, when are you going to finish, you know. Um, but being able to, and this is just maybe a year or two before I met you, because the question came up, how can I read faster? Right. Right. Because I want to read this. And part of it, too, was I was trying to force myself to read nonfiction for my craft. Right. Right. And so I'm like switching back and forth. And um, but first of all, to finding some way to love reading, which the Da Vinci Code helped me to yeah. love reading and this kind of exploration, activating different parts of my brain. And I transitioned that into and I started to basically paint stories for nonfiction books. Right? Even if it's a kind of a really science dense nutrition book, I would turn it into magic and stories and whatever. Like I transition these skills back and forth. And so, but then meeting you and learning about your work, it just took things to another level. And this is my question for you yeah. saying all this because we're so tied to doing things a certain way from childhood. Part of this is trusting the process mm -hmm. because when you start to push the accelerator, you might feel uncomfortable going faster. Yeah. And you might feel like I'm not picking this up correctly. So how do we deal with that transition? You know, it makes me think about back in when I was in middle school, we had these this typing class and it was real typewriters, right? Because there were no mm -hmm. there were no computers when I when I was in middle school. And um and I never really did well in school, like all through school because my learning challenges. But, um, but that class particularly, I excelled in. And because, you know, when they were doing it, I was, I'd use the, I invented this uh, two finger method where I'm hunting and pecking with my <laughs> index fingers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it was cool because on the chalkboard, they would put my name and my last name really is quick and I would be the fastest typer in the class. Oh, yeah. And they let you do that for about a week. And the only reason is because when I visited, you know, family, you know, my grandparents, they had a, a rusty, they didn't have any toys, but they had a rusty, dusty typewriter. You know, so I practiced on that. Mm -hmm. um, and after a week goes by, the teacher was like, okay, we're going to teach you how to type. They let us kind of free form. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, no, I could teach this. Let me mm -hmm. teach everybody here. Mm -hmm. And um, no, and they're like, you have to use all your fingers. And there's these things called home keys. And I tried it. And what do you think happened to my, my typing speed? Yeah, it went down. Plummeted. Yeah, it did. So, of course, I know better at that age. So I go back to, you yeah. know, my tried and true strength using two fingers. Well, an interesting hap thing happened over the next few weeks because they had that leaderboard on the chalkboard and I, st I started going from one down to three 
you know, down to 11, you know, down to all the way to the bottom because I was stuck using those two fingers, mm -hmm. but everybody else was using this, you know, all their fingers. And I realized that, um, after a while, it's like, that's unfair. They're using five times more fingers. So I had to work five times harder. Mm -hmm. And the equivalent is to, to reading. Sometimes like when we first learn how to read, we're like reading with two fingers. And sometimes you have to take a step back to take a couple leaps forward. You know, so it's a different skill set, definitely. Um, but when you upgrade your skills, you get better results. So I, I would just remind everybody that, you know, it is something that's brand new, just like when, you know, I, I, I like teaching people just suggesting they brush their teeth with the opposite hand. And part of it is because it activates a different part of your brain, right? Um, kind of like an aerobics exercise. But the other reason why is it keeps you present. And it really helps you to, you know, flex your focus muscles. But the third reason is because it's like a gateway habit. It's like you could teach yourself a new skill and you say like, oh, if I could do that, what else can I do? What other habits or skills can I learn like that? And I think type, you know, typing is one thing, but reading is, is just another way. So yes, you're not going to be perfect the first time, but just like anything after doing it a little bit, and I promise you only a few days, you'll, it becomes second nature because it's more natural. And so I would encourage people, don't believe everything I'm saying, just test it for yourself and play with it. I think you have to try things at least three times. You know, one time to kind of, you know, be exposed to it, another time to, to you know, get better at it. The third reason is see if you like it or not, you know, and then you can make a decision. But, but ultimately I would say that, you know, it's just working with how your brain works when you understand how your brain works you can work your brain when you understand how your memory works you can work your memory ah awesome yeah we're like really being able to access our neo capabilities learning from you it it, it, it is yeah we could talk about skill acquisition because that's a little bit what the what this new book is about but you know steps in terms of learning any skill faster i think the mind is the ultimate adaptation machine mm -hmm. You know, and maybe you can't learn Kung Fu just, to, you know, just with a quick download. But there are certain things that you could do to be able to learn it absolutely uh, with not only better retention, but also more enjoyment. All right. So we're picking up higher quality skills and being able to, to read, comprehend better. Yeah. You said a key word. You said recall. Yes. All right. And this translates to a lot of different areas of our lives. Uh, just yesterday, my family and I were at Agape Spiritual Center. Michael Beckwith, you know, really good friend. And I think he's the second most frequent guest we've had on the show. And he was dropping gems, all right? Yes. Pun intended, come on. But he was dropping a, some incredible nuggets. And I saw some people were, they came with their notebooks, right? Mm -hmm. They came with little notepads and they were taking notes. But some people were just there to receive the, the good energy. And my question is, if we are taking notes, right? Some yeah. of those gems, because just like some of those things he said is just like, I want to remember that forever. I want to make that a part of who I yeah, am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But before you know it, by the time you get to the restaurant afterwards, you don't, you don't forgot what he said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how can we improve our recall? Yes, and this is so very important. Uh, I was on stage recently with Les Brown and one of my favorite mentors and motivational speakers. And uh, people were asking him questions uh, when he was doing his uh, Q&A. And people were like, how do you remember all those quotes? And he was just pointed to me and he's like, I, you know, I, st I studied Jim's reading and memory techniques, but it's amazing when you could learn something and then retain it, right? There's a forgetting curve where when you listen to something once within 48 hours, research suggests you lose about 80% of it, which, which is, you know, for people who want to be optimized, that could be very disappointing also as well. So a number of ways you could remember facts and figures or quotes. Um, I would st first, I would, if you want to learn something, I always learn it with the intention of teaching somebody else. I think that makes a difference. If somebody had to give a TEDx talk about what they learned from our conversation right now, they would focus a whole lot better. They would take more thorough notes, right? They might be posting questions online for both of us and tagging us so we could be able to address it. Because when you teach something, you take advantage of something called in research, the explanation effect. The explanation effect says that when you learn something with the intention of explaining to somebody else, you're going to learn it so much better and uh, in a fraction of the time. And, and that's why you learn anything. You learn There's two reasons you learn something. Number one, of how you could benefit from it. 
And the second reason is how you could share with somebody else. You know, I believe the formula is you learn to earn to return, right? The faster you could learn, the faster you could earn, especially in today's society, in today's information age, because knowledge is not only power, knowledge is profit, right? It's this, not just a separation of those who have and those who don't have, there's a separation between those who know stuff and those who don't know stuff. People who subscribe to your show, they listen to your show, they, are at a, they have a huge advantage because they can make better choices because they, they know stuff that other people just don't know. Most of your listeners, and I know many of them because uh, we recommend your show all the time, they, you, most of your listeners alone have probably forgotten more about health than most people w in their sphere will never know, mm. right? And so I just want to just acknowledge everybody who's listening and watching because, you know, like they're doing the work. There's a quote in Limitless in my book that says, life is the letter C between B and D. Life is C between B and D, where B stands for birth, D stands for death, life C, choice. Like we always have these choices, choices of what we're gonna feed our minds, what we're gonna feed our bodies, choices of who we spend time with, choices of where we're gonna put our focus and everything, our money, or where we're gonna live, what we're gonna do as a career, what we're gonna study. And I believe we're, our lives are the sum total of all these choices that we've made. But because people listen to your show, they can make better informed choices, right? And so that's why, you know, I was doing a program at Google and they're like, Jim, why do I have to remember all this? We have this search engine, right? But in, in the moment, people could only make decisions on the information that they remember. And that's why memory is so very important. So I would say, start with the intention of teaching somebody else and you're more likely to be able to remember it. Certainly taking notes is better than not right? Because it helps you to retain it and you could review your notes. There's something called spaced repetition that we talk about in the book, where if you review something at set intervals, it helps you to consolidate short to long-term memory. Like maybe you, you review your notes an hour later, a day later, a week later, a month later, and then it just becomes part of your, your uh, gestalt of information, you know, inside your long-term memory. So a spaced review. Other th ways of improving your memory is, uh, and you could use, we'll talk about AI and how it could augment your intelligence, but is uh, retrieval practice. Like actually setting it up where people could actually quiz you because it's the retrieval. So there's three parts to your memory, as you know. You encode information, you store it, and then you retrieve it. And one of the best ways of having active recall is to test your, your existing knowledge through active retrieval. And so, you know, at your, uh, your family dinners, right, you go around and you could ask people what they, what they learned today. Instead of just saying, how was your day at school? Then they say, good. You know, what specifically did you learn today? Right? What did you share with somebody else? And all of a sudden you ask these questions and they have to go in and then they'll learn it better because they're teaching it and explaining it to somebody else. So between teaching it to somebody else, active retrieval, space repetition, some people will actually use music while they study. And certain music is actually really, and this is not everybody, just like not every diet is for everybody, but some people music's distracting for them, but other people like uh, especially classical music without lyrics, will help you to retain information better, having it in the background. Specifically, uh, Baroque, the Baroque era. It's about Vivaldi, Bach, Handel. It's about 60 beats per minute. And that's like, it harmonizes with a resting heart rate. So you're in a relaxed state and you're very suggestible and you can retain information. So some people do that. Similar to when, I mean, how many lyrics to songs do you know? Wow, I mean, songs, you might not have heard the song in 30 years and you right. read the lyrics. And you hear like one or two notes and it just yeah. brings it all back. But yeah, and how many did you actually actively try to like study those lyrics? Yeah. Probably not. And so we, sometimes we learn the best when we don't even realize that we're learning. That's why I love your show because you combine three E's, right? You give an education, but you make it incredibly entertaining. And that's where you get empowerment, right? Education times entertainment equals empowerment. Because education is kind of like, I don't know, it's like that nutritious that doesn't necessarily taste too good but entertainment's kind of like that dessert but if you combine the two then it's like you kind of fool your nervous system and uh, and then but you know like but then entertainment the mind candy is not usually very nutritious so you could kind of combine you know the 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 nutrition and the the good tasting so it could be nutritious and delicious like your cookbook e cubed yeah yeah e cubed i love that man thank you so much for sharing that these are very, again, all of this is so practical. It seems obvious. A lot of times when you when you say things just like, 
yeah like but yeah. we're not taught these things and that's what i love i have the same similar love as you do to read all the white papers and do a deep study into certain sciences mine especially in psychology and in neuroscience but i'm also thinking how can i make this fun how can i make this simple because common sense is not common practice i think a lot of people who are listening they know what to do but there are they doing what they know Right. So that's a big part of it. Just encouraging people, you know, with stories and challenges and, you know, making making learning fun again. Yeah. I shared this with you years ago when we first started because you were asking me about, you know, how I was going about what I was doing. And I just happened upon it, which was as I'm doing research, I'm thinking, how can I teach this? Yeah. You know, and literally that was it just like it was a switch that was flipped in my mind. And so. And also one of the craziest things, even at this age of, you know, we've got AI like full on in our reality right now, but even with the published paper, you know, maybe it's like a huge meta analysis, finding some kind of benefit. We'll just say with uh, turmeric, mm -hmm. right? Being able to, there's some researchers at UCLA finding that it helps to improve your memory, yeah. right? So this can be randomized, placebo controlled, all the things published, it can take up to 15 years before that becomes common knowledge and education mm -hmm. for university students. There's this huge lag still, yeah. 10 to 15 years on average. And so having access to someone who's doing this work for you, who's consolidating it into a way that's entertaining and fun and useful yeah. right now, so you don't have to wait a decade to get the good news on something simple you can do to empower yourself. like. That's really the, the secret sauce. Right. And when you make it into small, simple steps that people could do, then it, it takes the barrier or the threshold to action. You know, a lot of times people, like, they know they should work out, but it's, uh, you know, it's too big for somebody who hasn't done it, right? So maybe a small, simple step is putting on your running shoes, all right, or just getting to the gym, right? You break things down because inch by inch, it's a cinch, but yard by yard, it's, it's too hard. Right. It could be too intimidating. If people want to just, you know, have, you know, your eight, eight pack and everything else, that could be for somebody who's just kind of getting started, it could be too big. But if they ask themselves a simple question, we talk about the power of questions. What is the tiniest action I could take right now that will give me progress towards this goal where I can't fail? Right. Because little by little, a little becomes a lot. This is something you brought up a little bit earlier, and I definitely want to dive into it and hear what you have to say about skill acquisition especially in this day and age. Let's yeah. talk about that. Well, I think, you know, if people want to be more limitless at school or limitless at work, you know, a big part of it is you want to create a result. And in order to create that result, we need skills to be able to, to achieve those things. And I, I would imagine everybody has a skill that they want to add, maybe something on their to learn list. Maybe they want to learn a language. Maybe they want to learn how to dance. Maybe they want to learn Python or coding or something like that. So um, very, very simple. I, I created a word and it's called prasma. All right, I want to create something that's kind of unique. Prasma is a combination of two words, practical and plasma. It's like practical plasma. And it's like, what does that mean? Well, practical is pragmatic. Plasma is this dynamic fluid, right? That's what plasma is. And, and that sometimes learning is very dynamic and it's, it's fluid, right? It could change depending on context. So PRASMA is an acronym, and I'll give people just the points to, so they, they have some kind of framework when they want to learn a new skill. And the P stands for preparation, right? So everyone could think about the skill they want to acquire. Maybe it's Kung Fu, or maybe it's to fly a helicopter or whatever it happens to be. I'm talking about obviously like matrix in my mind, mm -hmm. but the P is preparation. And so preparation is um, things like the goal. Like what's, what's the goal? Like setting a good intention. Maybe if you want to learn a language, you want to be able to have five minutes conversation of some, with somebody in that native tongue, right? Or maybe you want to learn very specifically the 200 most used word and words in that language. Maybe that's your goal. Maybe if you're learning the skill of, I know you're a big fan of stand up. maybe your goal is to do a, a five minute set, right? An open mic night at a comedy club or something like that. Uh, whatever the outcome is so we set so that's part of the outcome right you're setting the specific you're making it measurable attainable and so on um also resource allocation how much time and energy are you going to put towards this goal that'd be part of your prep the r in prasma stands for the research and that's where you're actually researching that skill maybe if it's to learn a language you want to go online and look up 
like the 200 most used f words or the most the, the 20 most used phrases in that language so this would be your your research part of it right the a is your acquisition and this is actually where you're learning the skill you start breaking it down and using the 80 20 rule right you deconstruct it meaning that you don't have to learn all the words to be functional in a language this is where you're maybe you're using what's the 20 percent if you're learning let the, the skills golf what are the 20 percent that's going to be 80 percent of the results mm -hmm. or you're learning to be able to to be able to do a certain dance move and you could be able to break it down and deconstruct it now um, the s in prasma is the is the skill review that's the practice that's where like deep work would come in right you're putting in your the proverbial like 10,000 hours, which we know you can do it. You can cut that down dramatically, obviously with, with certain skills and mindset on top of that. And then finally the M and the A, uh, the M is mastery. And this is what I would just encourage everybody. Once you get a certain level where it's second nature, there's always another level, right? That's where you're optimizing, right? You're looking for that. Let's say it's sports or basketball. You're looking for those nuances that make a big difference, right? Um, maybe also part of mastery would be health optimization or brain optimization, right? Optimizing your sleep with, you know, you, one, one of your many expertise that will get you to the next level or optimizing your nutrition, right? Or your stress management, things like that to get the next level. So that's mastery and beyond. And then the A is the application. Just reminding everybody that we don't learn something in a vacuum. If you could go do it in the real world and get real world feedback. Like I have a friend who really wanted to do stand up and he started he was so nervous about it so he started to to do jokes in the subway in new york city right mm -hmm. and how but those were that was where you get real world feedback or doing open mic night and seeing you know kind of like how a lot of legends like would would do it where they would see the feedback from the audience so they would know just like as a public speaker or something else getting real world feedback from from the world you know whether it's language learning maybe you joined a you know, an online group. They have meetups actually in every city where you could go and just pay for your own dinner and you have to converse in another language, right? This would be real world application and feedback. But the idea here is most people, when they want to learn a skill, they just kind of jump into it, right? Without any map or plan. Yeah. But this gives people a little bit of a framework and stages or phases that they could follow to be able to, to do it more clearly and with, with less friction. Oh, I love it. I love it. Skills to pay the bills. Skills to pay the bills. So good, man. Now, one of the coolest things that you've been working on recently, and I got to participate in this a little bit, is highlighting for us something, that, again, that should be Captain Obvious, but we don't really think about, is that we all have very unique brains. Yes. No two brains are alike. Yeah. And we have unique ways of learning, and we have unique ways of carrying ourselves and operating, mm -hmm. unique perspectives unique ways that we are interacting with other people. Yeah. And you have a really wonderful quiz that you put together. Yeah. And my wife and I took the quiz and lo and behold, we have different outcomes. Right, and right. so I'm looking forward now to getting some feedback on this yes. and what my my quiz results are saying. So can you talk about yeah, this quiz? This and, is a yeah. game changer in the new book. Um, so I realized that people want suggestions, but not everything is for everybody right? Everybody reads a little different. They think a little different. They relate and communicate a little bit different. And we realized over years of doing this, that there are four primary cognitive types, and I call them brain animals, you know, just to make it fun. A lot of people take these quizzes, like what Game of Thrones character are you? What Harry Potter, you know, character are you kind of thing. But we create a quiz it only takes about four minutes. And it's a brain code. So C O D E. And these are the animals. The C is the cheetah. And if you're a cheetah, you're a fast actor. You're, you're, you really implement, you apply, you move very fast, you thrive in fast paced environments because you go by your intuition and also you adapt very quickly, right? And the O in code is the logical owl. These are people that love facts and figures and formulas. They love data, right? If, and just think about it, like a cheetah is going to invest differently than an owl would. They would relate differently. They would sell differently. They would buy differently, right? They would also learn differently. They would read differently and remember things differently. The D is your dolphin. And these are your creative visionaries. They have wild imaginations. They're extremely good at pattern recognition and they're very creative, right? And depending on what 
cognitive type you are, it would also determine what element you would really thrive in in a career, right, as you think about it. And then finally, the E in code are your elephants, and these are your empaths. They love teams, they love social, they, they have strong interpersonal skills, and they're, they're very loyal, and, and they bring people together, you know, clean collaboration and communication. So we realized that, you know, when people were asking, how do you remember names or how do you read, it's similar, you know how you have like personalized medicine or personalized nutrition? Now we could get people personalized learning based on their cognitive type. So when people take the quiz, they get a very detailed report on if you're a cheetah, you could read this way, right? If, if you're an owl, you could remember this way based on your, see, what I learned over 30 years, it's not how smart you are, it's how are you smart. Right? It's not how smart your kids are or how smart your team is, how smart your significant other is. It's how are they smart? Because we all have a way where we just, like if I asked everyone to write their name first and last with their dominant hand, they would do it with a certain level of ease and, and, and uh, you know quality. But if I ask you underneath that switch hands and underneath write your first and last with your non-dominant hand, that second time would take longer the quality probably wouldn't be as good and would feel uncomfortable. Some people, when they're interested in a topic and they're not getting it, sometimes they're trying to learn it with the opposite hand. So it takes longer, it's uncomfortable, and the quality of the retention, the fidelity is not as strong. You know, so I just want to remind people, and this is the great thing about understanding your cognitive type, is it takes the judgment out of it. You know, where sometimes we're hard on ourselves because we don't connect, but sometimes the way the teacher teaches is different than the way the student learns and you're like two ships in the night and you pass each other and you don't even realize the other one's there and there's no connection right so when we discovered this you know what we do with clients is we determine their brain animal type and then we know what their dominant thinking is how they prefer to learn and we pulled from like left brain right brain dominance to create this we create you know pull from myers-briggs introvert extrovert, uh, multiple intelligence theory, you know, from Howard Gardner out of, out of Harvard, you know, uh, cognitive styles and preferred learning styles. Some people like visual, auditory, kinesthetic, you know, so we pull from multiple disciplines to integrate into a simple four buckets. And then it's fun. People could take the quiz at mybrainanimal.com and it's free. There's nothing to buy and you get this detailed report. And then I follow up with emails based on your cognitive type. So if you're a cheetah, cheetahs love uh, to sprint. So we, we teach them how to read quicker, how to be able to scan and pick up words. You know, owls are more meticulous in terms of the facts and we show them how to take notes and really lean into their style and give people suggestions on how they can relate to others. So you, you took the quiz and you were a, a cheetah. cheetah. Yeah, because yeah. you, you are incredibly fast acting, right? You, you are a very strong owl. You know, so I probably imagine nobody's any one animal, right? right. Or a it's combination. A yeah. Certainly, you have a primary, you have secondary, um, but you're able to implement and execute and be able to put things in action. And sometimes that could, you know, sometimes an owl could be frustrating because they want to get everything, you know, absolutely perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, and they're more into the data than they are into putting that into into application, right? Other people, the elephants, like we had our whole team do it you know, a couple dozen people. And we noticed like the customer experience people, they were primarily elephants. You know, they're empath, you know, they're empathic. They really care for their customers. You know, our financial person is a very dedicated owl. You know, uh, you know our, our, our CEO is a creative visionary like Dolphin. And so it, it, it's very telling, you know, and then the way you could kind of organize your team. And it's interesting thing to talk about at your family meals even, you know, in terms of what their dominant animal is. So that happened for us at dinner last night, actually, because I read my summary and my son said, what, B? Oh, thank you. <laughs> it does. Man, you look handsome over there, by <laughs> there. the way. The light's hitting you in a certain way. You're looking good, boy. Um, but yeah, just being able to to share that. And they were just like, especially my older son was like, yeah, that's dad. Right. Um, but here's the thing. As you mentioned, being that I have some of the owl kind of traits as well my wife is full-on owl i mean mm. she's out here hoo -hoo, she's hooing and that intersection if you can match those up it right. can be something really special and as you know like she runs everything she runs you know our team and helps to make all the magic happen and but for me and i've said this before one of my favorite character traits in a person is speed of implementation like people that just you learn something and you do something like yeah. that's me 
I don't want to have a meeting. That's where we would have conflicts. I don't mm -hmm. want to know the 10 things. It's going to just make me like want to go take a nap. Just tell me like two things. Let me go and crush it, dominate, yeah. execute on that thing. And then I'll get to the next thing, you know. And so being able to understand our different, um, you know, characters and also learning about even with your team, like you just mentioned, being able to understand how people, where they're coming from, because yeah. we tend to just be like, why don't you think like I do? Right, which right, right. just creates a lot of suffering. No, no doubt. It just gives you a different lens into, into the world. And again, it takes the judgment from yourself, your self judgment, but also the judgment of the people around us, you know, because everybody is, is working their, you know, their brain animal. Yeah. So that's where we found like a middle ground because she would come in with a 10 and I would be like ready for the two. And so we, maybe we settle on three or maybe one thing actually, just right, tell me right. what, what's the most important thing. Let me just execute on that. And so we found basically three things. She's got three. Sometimes she just like, she, you could see she, mm -hmm. she wants to say more, but you know, we found that middle ground and uh, yeah, I mean, it's really spot on. And again, the, this is incredible, man. It's such a, it's such Thank a great you. gift. You said this already, you get decades of your brilliance, your, your education, you know, mul uh, multiple decades of you teaching others in this book. So Limitless Expanded Edition is out there right now on store shelves. You need to have this in your library. And this book is going to help you to read and maintain, recall the information mm -hmm. in other books. It's like yeah. a superpower. It, it's like um, like Lord of the Rings. They have that phrase, the one ring that, that controls them all. This would be the one book to help you learn, read, focus, apply all the other books without, a, without a doubt. And so again, run out right now, or of course we've got we've got these supercomputers in our hand as well. You we can do, head over do. to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, wherever your favorite retailer. Get Limitless Expanded Edition, the new insights in here. Let's talk a little bit more about what people are going to be getting. Yeah. Some of the new stuff. People go to limitlessbook.com, and really we wrote this book for a post-pandemic AI world. Yeah, you know where you have to be agile at work, where it's really about momentum. We talk about three M's in the book, part of the limitless model. In order to become limitless, you have to control the controllables, right? And I believe these difficult times, they could distract you. These difficult times can diminish you or these difficult times they could develop you. Ultimately, we decide with our choices. But there are three things we could always control, our mindset, our motivation, and the methods we're using, right? Our, our head, our heart, and our hands. We could always control those three things. And so we, we lean into things that we could control. And when you do all three, you get the fourth M, which is really the focus of the book, which is personal momentum, right? When you have the mindset, which are the set of assumptions and attitudes you have about something, because often the problem is not the problem. Often the problem is our mindset about the problem, our attitudes and assumptions about the situation. And so, um, so we show people how to unlimit their mindset because if you teach someone a method on how to remember names and languages and do this, give talks without, you know, from memory, then, um, but if your mindset is I'm too old or I'm not smart enough, or I have a horrible memory, you know, people at events all the time, they come to me after they, you know, after my talk and they just say, Jim, you know, I'm just not smart. And I would say, stop. If you fight for your limitations, you get to keep them. If you fight for your limits, they're yours. So that has to be unlimited. Right. And so we talk about a process for, you know, reframing those thoughts and how to, you know, go through and, and change those limiting beliefs because all behavior is belief driven. Right. Your brain is this incredible supercomputer and your self-talk are the programs will run. So if you tell yourself, I'm not good at remembering names, you will not remember the name of the next person you meet because you program supercomputer not to. But you could also be stuck in life. So I, I talk about being stuck, meaning that change is hard. You know, going after your dreams can be very scary, but nothing is as scary as being stuck somewhere where you don't belong. And I feel like a lot of us are stuck or limited. Like as a kid, I felt very limited because I couldn't learn or read or do these things. And so, you know, we, if you're stuck, part of that, if you think about a box, stuck in a box, there are three dimensions that keep that box, right? Three, it's three dimensional. So the first dimension is your mindset. Right, you could not believe it's possible. You know, might might believe you don't deserve it, right? Or you're not. Maybe it's possible for someone else, but it's not possible for you. But let's say you unlimit that. The second thing that could keep you stuck in that box is the second M, which is your motivation. You might not be motivated to get out of that box. 
right? right? Maybe you have this big goal, but you're not motivated to eat that food or to meditate or be able to, you know, do that thing with your sleep. So we show people in the book how to tap into limitless motivation through a process of purpose, energy. Uh, sometimes we're more exhausted. You eat a big processed meal, you're not very motivated to read, right? If you have a newborn child and you haven't slept in three nights, you're probably not very motivated to go to the gym. So it's an energy part. Uh, so people here, you've, you've shared so much about, you know, optimizing your energy and vitality and then breaking things down to small, simple steps. So we talk about habits, how to access flow states, right? That state of flow where you feel your best and you perform at your best. But then the third M that could keep you stuck, maybe you have limitless mindset and limitless motivation, but you don't have them. You're using old methods, right? Maybe old methods for sales or marketing, or in this case, reading. And then you could still be stuck in that box. So we show people how to upgrade. So like, I really feel like the biggest mistake people are making right now out of fear is they're downgrading their dreams to meet the current situation. We shouldn't downgrade our dreams to meet the current situation. We should be thinking about how to upgrade our mindset or motivation and the methods we're using to be able to meet our, our destiny. But when you unlimit all three of these things, then you have no friction. Then you have momentum, you know, positive momentum where it's just this natural progression towards bigger and bigger goals. And the things we talk about in the book that will amplify momentum, you know, the velocity in your acceleration are things like knowing your brain animal type. When you understand who you are, you can lean into those strengths and have more momentum. You know, we talk about brain nutrition, something that you're an expert on, right? The different foods and, and potential nootropics you could use to be able to accelerate your focus, your mental energy, that will give you more momentum. We have new chapters in there on uh, things like learning agility, how to be limitless at work. And so if you're working remote or you're, you know, hybrid kind of thing, or you're switching from this book to this book, fiction to nonfiction, how do you do it more agile with more agility? Just like you're incredibly, your family is very, it's like, the model like superhero family but you have you have this physical fitness and like physical agility is your flexibility your speed your ability to adapt well you want mental agility you want greater mental muscles to be able to to be able to keep up with things to be able to be quick on your feet with your thinking and your your, your ability to be flexible in your approach um, so we really show people how to optimize their their mental muscles and then there's a whole new chapter also on on artificial intelligence like people are so scared that we're going to, you know, the Skynet or, or what, you know, and then this is out of the box already, right? And technology for me, even when I talk about digital distraction in the book and digital dementia and digital deduction, digital deluge, you know, and digital depression, you know, where people are just comparing themselves to everybody else and it affects our mental health um, and our brain health also as well. You know, we talk about different things that people could do to use artificial intelligence to be able to, I always think with AI, it's for me, AI is not artificial intelligence, it's augmented intelligence. And I'm always asking my primary question, questions of the answer is how do you use AI to enhance your HI, your human intelligence? And there's so many strategies that we pack in there on how to use it to get smarter. Mm. Oh, this is so exciting, man. Thank you so much for putting this together for all of us. And everybody, again, pick up a copy right now. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, your yeah. favorite local bookstore. We create a great site, limitlessbook.com, and people could get all the links to all the stores there. And then, uh, you know, a couple of really special bonuses, brain training, that's worth many times the, the investment of the book. As usual, man, you over-deliver. You know, you do over-deliver. And uh, your previous version of the book is one of the books, I think I've gifted that book more than any other book. Thank As you. a matter of fact, I was just giving it to even certain, you know, segments of of my audience for a time period you know thank like you. you'd have maybe like a special in the book and i just buy a bunch of them thank and, you we we we, you we donate the proceeds author proceeds to charity so for we built schools everywhere our team from guatemala to kenya to ghana uh for children who have no access to education and also alzheimer's research for women uh women are as you know are twice as likely to experience alzheimer's than men and most of the research is still done on male brains and treatments on male brains but in memory of my grandmother who passed of uh, Alzheimer's. So it's, it's a real, yeah, but it, it's, it's always, it's always so much fun being with you, my, my friend. Yeah. It's my honor. My honor. Yeah. Grab your copy, Limitless Expanded Edition right now. Take that quiz. And take the quiz. Yeah. Absolutely. Can I challenge everyone to do something? Let's go. Yeah. yeah. After you take the quiz, My Brain Animal, you'll get all this amazing art work. I would, I would suggest people post what animal they are and tag us both. You know, and so, so we get to see it and I'll repost some of them and we'll also gift, 
you know, a few copies out to your community just as, as a thank you. Amazing. What's your handle on IG? Uh, Jim Quick Everything. K-W-I-K. At Jim Quick, at Sean Model. Tag us. Yes. I love you, man. Thank you so much. Love you too. Jim Quick, everybody. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. First, to find out what our gifts are, the people that we love and are close to us, what their gifts are. And then we've got to teach them how to use them appropriately so that Superman is a hero yeah. and not a villain.